Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today on our Outsider Art Focus Day for Intersect Chicago slash SOFA. The fair will be live and open to the public through November 12th and will live on on Artsy till December 5th. I'm Becca Hoffman, Managing Director of Intersect Art and Design. I'm pleased to welcome our cultural partner, Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Arts. Established in 1991, Intuit is a premier museum of outsider and self-taught art. Defined as the work of artists who demonstrate little influence from the mainstream art world and who instead are motivated by their unique personal visions. Today's program is in two parts. Part one, uh, Intuit president and CEO Deborah Kerr it will be in conversation with art historian Lisa Brunquist on her forthcoming book, The Power and Fluidity of Girlhood in Henry Darger's Art. Then following a 15 minute break, Kerr joins Intuit chief curator Allison Amick to tour the museum and discuss Amick's curatorial insight into the exhibition, Outsider Art, the collection of Victor F. Keen. Keen's collection includes some of the top outsider artists such as Thornton Dial, uh, James Castle, and Joseph Yoakum. Now I will turn it over to Deb. Please enjoy uh, both parts of the discussion and please feel free to post any questions into the chat box. Also, don't forget to check out the fair live at intersectchicago.com. Thanks so much. Thank you, Becca. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Carr here at Intuit. And as you can see, I'm actually sitting uh, just in front of our recreated Henry Darger room, one of our uh, most important exhibitions and one that continues to draw crowds from all over the world. I'm thrilled today to be with my friend and colleague, Lisa Runquist. Uh, Professor Lisa Runquist is um, uh, at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Uh, Lisa is former head of the art and art history department there. Uh, she is, uh, has, has done her doctoral thesis on the Vivian girls and is considered to be one of the leading experts in the world on Henry Darger. But of course, we're excited and celebrating today because, uh, because Lisa's book is coming out in the spring. So that's, that's very exciting for us. Lisa, as we begin, why don't you kind of give us a bit of a... Uh, contextual look at outsider art as a genre before we dive into Henry Darger's Vivian Girl. Well, first, Deb, I want to tell you, uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this session. I really appreciate um, doing this with you, so thank you. Um, I uh, have been part of the outsider art field for quite a while. I teach classes on the subject but I know that it is a complicated and problematic kind of genre. Um, it is something that involves thinking about the art world at the center um, or the Western art world at the center of things while everything else is on the periphery. Um, and so that leaves it open to a lot. Um, you know, the, the art world is, um, really art worlds. And I often want to foreground that with my students that we are looking at work that, although may not have been recognized by the art world or the Western art world in the past is now been brought into that space and into the marketplace, uh, into art historical interpretation. And so it is a genre that is shifting and evolving uh, and it has within it, you know, historic artists like Henry Darger, Martin Ramirez, but also living artists like George Widener, uh, who is someone that is somewhat of a crossover artist, I guess you could say that he is in one, one sense in that outsider category, but also a contemporary artist. So it is a, a genre that's evolving and changing and that it offers opportunities, but also complications and people need to grapple with various things. Um, the term itself uh, has a marginalizing taint to it. So that is something that um, I think places like Intuit, uh, you know, you're definitely thinking about where you wanna go in the future and how you define who you are um, and I know that your definition has a lot to do with um, simply those that are not practicing art or making creative expressions with the art world in mind or with any kind of 
um, any kind of training or acknowledgement of the art world. Is, is that correct to say? Yes, yes. And I think that, um, you know, as we've talked before, Lisa, many of these artists start out making the art for themselves. And, and, and for us, outsider doesn't mean we are pushing them to the outside. Outsider refers to the fact that these are artists working um, within their own context, not within a context that's that's predicated on understanding what's happening among other artists in the mainstream or contemporary art world, that they're working outside that construct. And, and one of the things that, when in my work on Henry Darger, I came to realize that um, what I was in some ways working against uh, was the early scholarship that really privileged psychobiographical explanation and reduced his art to pathologic production. And what I saw in his work was a really rich, complex terrain of cultural appropriation. And with that appropriation comes the baggage of um, especially like little girls, how we see little girls, how we think about them, um, how we equate them with innocence and vulnerability. Uh, and so I just saw his work as being, um, they kind of that was glossed over. And the real content of his work is his filtering of culture, how he took that in, remade it, and in some ways even kind of exploited, especially with the little girl imagery, exploited um, different kinds of characteristics uh, that I think made his, his art more sensational and his story more sensational. Like he understood uh, something about that little girl image and then used it in his work to um, tell his story and to make his story this big, dramatic, long, um, difficult, war-bound kind of epic. Yeah, we're gonna dig into that a little bit more, Lisa. I just wanna uh, mention how we met. We met in 2017 when Intuit did a whole year long series of exhibitions about Henry Darger. And I think that one of the most important exhibitions we've ever done is the one that you curated, which was Betwixt and Between Henry Darger's Vivian Girls, which we put on that year. And that actually is what ultimately led to the production of this book is your deep dive into what prompted Henry Darger to use these little girls as his heroines. So for me, one of the most interesting things that, that came out of that exhibition and my own transformation in how I thought about Henry Darger was the concept of gender transformation. We, you and I have both seen a lot of hypotheses that didn't make sense to us about why Henry Darger's Vivian girls and the children in his stories sometimes have uh, male genitalia. And your, um, your research on this and how we explain that in the exhibition to me was one of the most important things I think we've been able to contribute to the literature on Henry Darger. So tell us about gender transformation in, in Darger's girls. Well, th well thank you for the, those compliments. Um, I look at his work and I see the frequency of this kind of image of what I call the child with the intersex characteristics. Um, and that it is an ambiguous image. Uh, I was looking for patterns in his art and a kind of internal logic as to how the art kind of created its own dynamic. Uh, and I kept seeing the frequency of this image of running girls, especially girls that are in peril or they are fighting, they're running to or from something, that that's when he tended to include this schematic male genitalia between parting legs and running legs. And so I began to think about the frequency then to me signaled an importance or some kind of significance. Uh, even though it's not mentioned in writing in his book or explained, um, it is there and it's you know obvious in his work. And so I thought there's something going on there that has to do with a meaningful signifying image. And that in his writing and in the captions, 
uh, for his work, he always refers to them as little girls. There's no kind of uh, spectrum that he mentions, but obviously visually there is one. And so his insistence on them as little girls um, caught my attention, as well as the fact that he refers to them as saints. They are Christian, they are holy, uh, they are everything that goodness is. And so to me that morphology or that changeling characteristic did not signify something that was odd or you know, sometimes you think about hybridity as a signal or a sign of something that could be about evil or um, a bad omen or something of that sort. So it seemed to me that this was something that had to do with their holiness, their goodness, um, their ability to fight, because it's typically in these, these moments when um, uh, lots of, um, you know, chase scenes are going on or something of that sort. So I started to think about his, um, what is his world? You know, what is in the, the darker room? What is he doing? And of course his Catholic faith is very important to him. It really structured his life. He went to mass daily, sometimes more than once. Um, the room that you were in is filled with all kinds of Catholic material culture, uh, lots of objects and icons. And um, his, um, his interest in Joan of Arc struck me um, as something that was um, significant. So I began to read into Joan of Arc and found a group of scholarship about female saints that went beyond their social standing. Some of them, according to their stories, actually transformed and, and had male characteristics. Some of them grew beards. Uh, some of them uh, were uh, masqueraded as men, um, but um, this group of women were known as um, virile, uh, virile saints. And the phrase was used, becoming male. Um, and one of the main um, saints in this group, uh, of course, is Joan of Arc. Uh, but also Vivia Perpetua. And so of course the name struck me as having a somewhat of a, you know, equivalence to Vivian girls, um, which seems to be very particular and Darger was someone who really um, chose his words carefully and, you know, made up names, but they were often appropriated from other sources. So I began to think about um, what could be this connection. And after reading about Vivia Perpetua, who is referred to as Christ-like, athletic, self-sacrificing. She was martyred in a Colosseum and very much kind of gave up her own life in the Colosseum. Although she was injured, she had a gladiator. Um, she coaxed a gladiator to slit her throat um, during this, according to her um, hagiography and her story. Um, but she had several visions uh, and one of her visions was that she transformed into a man. And she had this vision the night before she went into the Colosseum that she was going to fight uh, another man in the Colosseum. And as part of the protocol at that time, the members stripped naked um, as part of their athleticism. And in her dream, she said she looked down and she said, I became a man. So she envisioned herself as male in order to go into that Colosseum and fight. Um, in and battle. The, yeah. In battle, yeah. And so I began to think about what are these saints that become male, these female saints, what do they represent? And a lot of the discussion about them is that they re represent Christian values of strength and fortitude and self-sacrifice. And that here is uh, possibly a divine precedent uh, for the Vivian girl. Um, Joan of Arc is present in his work. She, she shows up in one of the holy cards in an image. He also mentions her and equates the Vivian girls to the maid of Orleans. And so he does um, correlate Joan of Arc with his, his girl crusaders. Uh, and although I don't have any direct evidence, um, the chapter that I do write about gender is all about fluidity and the um, this lineage of female saints that become male either in transgressing social standards 
or even physically transforming um, as a kind of backdrop to thinking about Dargar's Vivians and what he might be uh, bringing into his work. And of course, the, the name Vivian um, comes from the prefix vivi, which means to animate or enliven. Um, and so, of course, vivia perpetua means everlasting life. Um, it sounds like a great drag name to me. <laughs> it sounds, you know, very, very much made up in that way. But um, uh, I think, uh, although I don't have, like I say, any direct correlation, I do have correlations between other female saints. So all that to me kind of adds up and here's a different possibility. Here's a different pathway to think about reason, you know, uh, as opposed to being irrational, but there could be some sort of fantastic divine precedent um, that Darger has absorbed from other sources that he's bringing in that these girls, when they are fighting, running, fleeing, you know, fleeing for the life, um, he does show them in this kind of body language um, as a way to um, kind of trigger the sense of their divine, um, their divine, um, forms. Um, I think of them as, you know, the transgressive in the way that they are girls, but not girls, and that they really um, go beyond the parameters of social and um, what we think of as social constructs for what girlhood is. Uh, but they also are kind of transcendent. Um, they are holy. Uh, and so I, I think that they're really complex symbols and complex protagonists and characters in his work. You know, you and I've had a lot of conversations about the fact that I think some people have tried to assign simplistic mm -hmm. reasons around Darger's choices. And I think that anyone who spends time with Darger's work will see that the work is incredibly sophisticated. He of course was well read. He read newspapers and magazines. He had a, a small library of, of books that were influencing him. So, you know, I really enjoy talking with you about this, um, th these Catholic influences and these uh, literature influences. As long as we're talking about the Catholic influences, I thought we might show this uh, letter that we have here in into its collection from the Society of the Little Flower. Uh, the Little Flower is, uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, Saint Therese of Lisieux, France. Uh, Saint Therese was a, a girl in her teens who became a nun, and she had a whole body of writings, and she became known as the Little Flower because of her, um, this one passage. Lisa, tell us about this passage, and, and that, of course, Henry would have known about it, and we have this letter. Uh, Mia, maybe we could show this briefly this letter that um, clearly um, Mr. Darger had written to uh, the, the local Society of the Little Flower and has received a letter back, dear client of the Little Flower. So I um, stumbled upon the Little Flower of Christ in an image that Darger created. And there is a um, scene where the Vivian girls are praying within a church. And in the background, there's a holy card of the sacred heart of Jesus and a holy card of a female figure that in previous scholarships, that a scholar wrote about it just in like a short little paragraph. And there was an image in the book and the scholar talked about um, in the background, there's a Jesus motif and also um, Virgin Mary. And I looked at that image and I thought, the Virgin Mary never wears a nun's habit. <laughs> um, that was obvious to me. So I looked into who this person was and I found out uh, it was St. Trace and that um, she referred to herself as the little flower of Christ. Um, and, I, and of course there's a, a lot of um, information about her. She was a beloved girl saint um, who was canonized around 1925 at similar time as Joan of Arc. Um, Darger was a, probably a member of her um, uh, group that was in Chicago. And that newsletter is from um, 
the Little Flower of Christ Society. And there are a couple other newsletters that he owned that are in the archives at the American Folk Art Museum, um, as well as another holy card image of her. So he was very much um, part of the veneration of this girl saint. And um, one of the things that she wrote about, she used a lot of floral tropes in her writing, uh, which is probably why she referred to herself as the Little Flower Christ. But the, one of the um, tropes she uses is a garden and that in this garden, there are things like roses and lilies, but it is the humble flowers like the daisies and the violets that garner Jesus's glances. Um, and so that caught my attention because the two Vivian girls that have floral names are Daisy Vivian and Violet Vivian. And so in this image you have um, two, uh, two figures in the back, a male and a female figure too, which made me think about kind of the, the fluidity of gender in his work, but they are exemplars in terms of sacrifice. And, and St. Trace was a, a confessor saint. Um, she wanted to die for her beliefs and she wanted to um, actually be like Joan of Arc. And she talked about um, being tied to the stake um, and wanting to give of herself um, for others. And that is kind of the storyline that's in that actual work by Henry Dargers that the Vivians in the caption are talking about uh, wanting to give of themselves for their, the sake of their enemies, uh, wanting to sacrifice something about themselves. And so this um, sacrificial pair, if you will, are in the background and uh, Darger does that in the other image with Joan of Arc. It's Joan of Arc and another image of Christ um, that are part of a, a larger narrative in the work where Violet Vivian has been shot and actually stepped in front of a, um, a shooter who was um, trying to shoot at a priest and she took the bullet. And so it is, a, again, another story about self-sacrifice and um, in the uh, uh, the kind of Christian values, the Catholic values of the Vivian girls. Yeah, so that, I believe that's from 1932. And so this is something that Darger kept his whole life. It's in really good condition. Um, and that is a typical image of St. Therese, which she is usually pictured with a crucifix, sometimes a tiny little Christ child floating around her and lots of roses that kind of drip off of that crucifix. And she was known for having a childlike countenance, big, big doe eyes, uh, and a smile. Um, and so she was, she died young. And so she's always been affiliated with being a little girl saint. And she figures in my book as part of a chapter on littleness or the diminutive in Darger's work. And so I talk about the little flower Christ, little Eva from Uncle Tom's cabin, as well as the littlest rebel or which he does remark upon and, and another portion of his writing, the little rebel as the Confederate um, child that uh, Shirley Temple portrays in um, one of her starring roles in the early 1930s of the littlest rebel. Well, now that I have my other camera working properly, I uh, mm -hmm. somehow, somehow it went out and came back in. So we've got it working properly, but here are some of those little girls that appear in Darger's work. And what we have here at Intuit in our Henry Darger archives are some of the coloring book pages and other ephemera that Darger used to trace. And those of you who are familiar with Darger's work may re, uh, be familiar with this little girl. Um, I call her little cooking girl, but sometimes she's cooking and sometimes she's doing other preparation. And in some of his work, she is repeated over and over again. I think that goes to um, once again, our conversations about the sophistication of the work, I think the repeated use of these little girl figures is mesmerizing in some ways. Now, so uh, to me, when I look at the coloring book images in particular, um, how clever Darger was to trace these images and they are essentially vacant. You know, the, they're linear drawings, they're very graphic. Um, so he could take still bodies and make them animated uh, with some modification. Um, there are also images that are, I, I started thinking about race 
Um, they are white children. A lot of them are, um, or we understand them as blonde haired. Um, so they have a kind of an emptiness, a kind of vacancy about them that we can inhabit um, kind of uh, emotionally, psychologically. And they are part of this aesthetic that we know as cute. Um, they're often disproportionate in their features. They, um, cuteness is something that um, is manipulative. Um, it um, is equated with maternal protection and um, adoration. So he is taking images that are cute and putting them into vulnerable situations, little girls. And so I think when we look at Darger's work, even though we know it's cartoonish and we know what the resources are where he took these images from, we feel the weight of the cultural baggage of the little girl image that we understand as um, vulnerable um, and something that we want to protect um, automatically. And this idea of innocence, um, you know, when I talk about him exploiting these kinds of things that in all of these images, there are these tensions of innocence and sexuality um, and tensions of um, power and vulnerability. And he puts them into different kinds of situations um, that um, I think bring all this out. And so they are very much a kind of multivocal image where there are different associations that sometimes can be in conflict with each other, um, depending on the context. Uh, so, you know, he could, there's a kind of economy about using them. He can use them over and over again, uh, but they also carry with them associations that we read into his work. And I'm sure he was very familiar with and actually, you know, expresses this in his writing. Um, so the little girl image is to me kind of the ultimate heroine, but also the ultimate victim. Um, and, you know, after 15,000 pages of writing, you can't find a better kind of um, hero and victim uh, at the same time um, to engage your audience, whether it's visually or in writing to talk about children at the center of that, especially little girls, um, I think is kind of genius in a way. Uh, and actually we still look at it today and we still have concerns and people look at it and they worry like, what am I looking at? Um, and to me, that's what drew me to Darger's work is that it seems on the surface really simple and childlike in a way, let's, you know, children's story. But once you start looking at it, you realize how complex and how much it involves you as the viewer, what you, how you feel about it, how you're drawn to the, the subject matter and, and the, the narrative that's going on. This is, this is one of my favorite images, and I think she does a good job of illustrating exactly what you're talking about. This is a, a tracing that Darger made of Little Miss Muffet, and you will see in many of his works this Little Miss Muffet face and image facing this way, facing the other way um, in, in multiple works of Darger's. Mm -hmm. And then I have another uh, favorite here, Lisa. This is... Uh, Little Umbrella Girl. And I've heard many people talk about uh, Darger being influenced by the Morton Salt Girl. Um, but this is the girl I see most often in the paintings, this, this coloring book page with this little girl with the uh, umbrella over her head and the rain coming down. And she's someone different than, than the Morton Salt Girl. Yeah, and, and interestingly, she's, she's repeated. It's not a, an exact replication, but there's another girl in the same kind of stance um, with the same umbrella um, that he's seeing there that, you know, this, a lot of these coloring books um, also offered a whole plethora of patterns, checkerboards and stripes and polka dots, which then help him create these mesmerizing kinds of images with, with all this great visual interplay. One of the things you and I have also talked about and was very present in your exhibition here, Lisa, was the, the discussion of hemlines and how the fashions in the paintings um, help us to interpret the age of the children. And in some, there, we actually have a, 
a work that's been on view here quite a bit at Intuit, that on one side, uh, are the Vivian girls are very young and they have these super short hemlines. On the other side, the girls appear to be a little bit older and they have these somewhat longer hemlines indicating uh, a somewhat older girl. And then we see, uh, I, I guess this is from, it looks like the 50s. I'm looking for the date. Oh, the date is. I think it's about rubbed off. 58, possibly. Yes. Um, if I remember right, that yeah, the the short hemlines um, were little girl fashions as they were known for ages seven through twelve, and Darger's girls, according to him, the Vivians are set ages seven through ten, uh, and so he was very particular in what he picked up from the popular media is that he was replicating those hemlines and uh, of course garnered a lot of his images from advertising um, where the girls are posing and moving in these kind of very ways where they show a kind of a profile or a three-quarter turn or a frontal turn and so they really um, gave us an indication of those hemlines and the hemline for the little girl fashion um, is very much based off of a Shirley Temple silhouette and her own fashion line that became very popular in the mid to late um, 1930s going into the 40s and really influenced a lot of children's or little girls wear um, from, from them then on. Right. And so Shirley Temple, you know, you would always see her thighs, you know, that was cut off as kind of mid thigh uh, and really accentuated things like bows and uh, sashes uh, at the waist um, and bows in the hair that was very much a Shirley Temple kind of look. And then uh, Lisa, you um, might want to comment on this one as a little bit of a change of subject. Mm -hmm. As you know, here in the, in the Henry Darger room, we have many, many of his scrapbooks where he had uh, cartoons and clippings of things he might want to um, use as influences or things he might want to trace. And this is a particularly dramatic cartoon that he had cut out and saved. Modern warfare is what it says. And right here in the middle, we have a anguished female character. Mm -hmm. and, and you can read from the image that she is of a certain age. Um, it is a girl, not an adult woman. Um, and you can read that by the clothing and the scale. But um, she seems to be the one figure that appears to be um, surviving or the girls in the background too are running, uh, but the image really presents the child um, at the center of this topic, I guess you could say of modern warfare and the, the dead that are around her and the explosion. Um, there's, you know, Darger really, um, you know, viewed children um, and promoted, you know, this idea of children uh, in this kind of vulnerable state. And he is of course reading all kinds of news from the Chicago newspapers. And if you look at the headlines, they're, they're very dramatic and kind of salacious and um, children surviving this or that or abductions. Um, there's lots of discussions about orphans at this time period and they figure heavily in his work and in his resources that he used. Um, but the child was very much um, on the minds of society, what to do with all these immigrant children, what to do with these orphans, what were the um, redemptive features of adopting a child for adults. And this of course played through all the Shirley Temple films. It played through a lot of the comic strips that he was reading and then all the articles that he was gleaning from the Daily News. Right. This is a, just an example of one of the dozens of notebooks that we have in which he clipped and pasted uh, the materials that he was interested in saving. And this is a little, um, he has taped this label on the front. And this is, uh, let's see, um, I can't read it com completely, but it's a numbered something of 10 of they'll do it every time and there ought to be a law, which were, uh, cartoons in uh, an earlier time, but here is one of my favorite objects, 
And this is a clipping of Hurricane Betsy in New Orleans, um, long before we had Hurricane Katrina and the damage on Bourbon Street. And we know that he was obsessed with the weather, did a um, years long uh, diary of Chicago's quite famous weather. And here in the room we have on the walls actually uh, hurricanes and other storms that uh, interested him that were on the walls of his room. So yeah, just, I, 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 one of the things that I, I was interested in in his work too that's not part of my book, um, but previous research is his interest in fire. And um, it was a way for me to kind of localize Henry Darger in Chicago. And, and as someone who grew up a couple of decades after the great Chicago fire, Chicago, you know, fire has always been uh, on the minds of Chicago and it's part of the kind of moment of the modern city, I guess, rebuilding of Chicago after the great fire. But um, Darger's interest in disasters and uh, all kinds of traumatic experiences, you know, really figure heavily in all his resource materials. Um, he read, a lot of those materials talk about children dying. There's a lot of emphasis on women and children that perished in flame or perished in an earthquake. And, and he recorded all that um, and kept that and also traced clouds and used it as visual resource material too, besides a kind of um, intellectual fodder, you know, for his work. Mm -hmm. Before I stop using my, my second camera here, just um, a couple of our wonderful paint pots um, that we have here in the room. And Henry Darger made these. Uh, we believe he mixed up his own colors of tempera. Um, our expectation here is that there were two reasons for that. One would be that uh, of course, he was mixing up the colors he wanted, and he and he gave them names. This one is Storm Cloud Purple. Uh, this one with a more traditional paint name, Cadmium Medium Red. But that, in addition, he might have wanted to experiment with tempera, which would have given him a more robust um, and lasting color than his traditional watercolors would have. Yeah, I think you said there are some watercolor palettes that lots look and like lots they're, of they're unused, um, that he really preferred the tempera. Uh, yes. Like you say, probably for its vibrancy. Um, but he labeled everything. Um, he did label everything. Yeah, and so um, that was helpful for me when I was reading through the realms of the unreal, which is 15,000 some pages. I admit I haven't read the whole book, of course. I'm not sure if anyone really has, but um, there is, um, you know, a, a outline um, at the beginning of the book that tells you what are the different wars, what went on, what are the different storms. And so you can, um, <coughs> of course, find your your way through his book with his own kind of direction. Um, there are notations to himself in some of his um, archival material. Uh, so there is just this kind of internal conversation. Excuse me. So Lisa, we have a few questions and um, let's maybe turn to those before we wrap up. Um, one person is asking, didn't he have a sister that was given up for adoption? And yes, indeed, his mother died in childbirth. Um, the sister was given up for adoption because his father was ill and didn't believe he could care for two children. And we uh, understand that Henry did try to find her, but was unsuccessful. Lisa, do you know more? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I know that he also um, appears that he also had a wish to adopt a child. And there are some notations he's made um, that seem like he is responding at least to himself, writing this out, his thoughts out as to, um, you know, questioning why he wasn't allowed to do that. There, we don't have any evidence of a kind of paperwork that he may have submitted, but it, it appears that um, you know, that definitely was on his mind and um, that he may have desired to have some sort of a semblance of a family. Um, he was interested in a dog at one time too, I think, um, and realized that it was probably too expensive. 
um, to um, adopt a dog. But yeah, there, there's been some um, speculation that the Vivian girls or the girls in his story are his attempt to kind of reconnect or save his uh, sister um, that he lost. Uh, but um, again, you know, that's something that again is uh, speculation. Great. There's, there's a question here and I think it's important to be asked. Um, one of our viewers is asking about, um, is there some sort of pedophilic aspect or intent to his work? Um, although it's seemingly asexual, is there research or analysis or evidence to suggest this or around his sexuality? And I know that we, we get asked those questions a lot and the others have theorized that that is present in his work. Um, I, you know, there's, there's no indication of that or that he abused children in any way. Um, what does seem to me, you know, in my research and, and this is what I write about a lot in the book is that these images are latent with that kind of idea of sexual repression, that it's part of our social baggage that those images carry. Um, there's an author, James Kincaid, who's written a lot about innocence and the, the fetish of the child um, in terms of sexuality. Uh, and he has looked at images from commercialism to movies and even figures like Shirley Temple. Um, you know, I often think about if, you, if you're aware of like Britney Spears, one of her first videos, Oops, I Did It Again, she's in a Catholic schoolgirl's outfit. There is this um, proximity between innocence and sexuality that we, that we um, place together, especially in American society. And a lot of um, people have written about, scholars have written about like the Coppertone Girl ad with the, with the dog pulling down of, the, um, of her um, swimsuit that um, we often um, sexualize children in commercialism and movies and that it's somewhat inherent in his work because it comes directly from those sources. Um, so I do write a lot about that. I don't claim that that's not going on in his work. Um, I think it is just inherent to American culture. And so that does seep into his work. Um, I don't make any presumptions of his own attraction to children beyond the fact of what I see in the work going on and what I see in his writings. Um, he does seem to venerate children um, and uh, refer to them as holy beings. And there's nothing in his writing that insinuates that, you know, there, there is a kind of pedophilic um, attraction to them, although there is an attraction there. Um, he obviously um, sees the little girl as this, you know, protagonist figure. And um, he also has images of children, there's the infant of Prague that's behind you. There's um, uh, child images of Jesus in the room. Um, so the child is something that in this early 20th century time period where Darger begins this project, where the little flower of Christ, who is a, like a, a little girl saint, uh, children are, are um, raised up as innocents. And the Catholic Church has, you know, some discussions about children as um, being noteworthy and, and the valuation of childhood changes in the early 20th century too. Um, so children are, are deemed to be in, in priceless is one of the phrases used that um, prior to this, um, you know, children were, Families had lots of children. They lived in an agrarian kind of situation. And that um, as we move into more industrialized um, early 20th century, the notion of a child's death becomes really devastating. Um, and, and so the, the whole perception of what is childhood and its shift to thinking about it as, um, you know, uh, something that is um, reduced redeeming, um, something that is special, that is um, beyond value. 
um, is I think infuses Darger's work. So I think it's more than just looking at the images and saying, are they pedophilic? I think it's, you know, there's a lot of things going in that make this image of the little girl really complex. And there's differences in how childhood was viewed in the early 20th century to how we view it today. Um, and I know a lot of people have kind of um, a knee jerk reaction to Darger's work and because it's an adult male um, making images or reappropriating images of little girls and we right away see a red flag with that. Um, so I do write about that in my book and um, Shirley Temple is one of the kind of models for that today. We watch her movies and see her sitting on all these men's laps and they sing to each other and they talk about their love for each other. Um, and it, uh, it gives us a funny tummy feeling. Um, but at that time, um, Shirley Temple was, um, you know, kind of thought to be like Teflon, like sexuality didn't stick to her. Um, her innocence was um, protective. Uh, and that didn't really change into a lot of Freudian um, theory and understanding became more mainstream when we began to think about repressed sexuality. Um, so there's something to think about with Darger's work is, you know, the time frame he made it in, uh, what is he absorbing from culture? What are his, um, you know, the, I, I found the resources, um, the books that he was reading, the, the figures that he um, references to be really important to think about and unpack his work. Um, and not try to see it from a 21st century viewpoint, but from the time period that he was making this work in. Thank you, Lisa. We're a little bit over time, but I do want to address one more que question quickly. And someone has asked, can we really expect um, an artist to be not influenced by um, contemporary and other artists right now? And I think that in fact, we are living in a society where it's difficult for anyone to be completely isolated from mainstream. And of course, we know that even Henry Darger was, was aware of and influenced by um, his contemporary context. So I think that uh, we've had a lot of conversation, Lisa, about the problems with the label outsider. Mm -hmm. And um, I acknowledge that there are problems with that label. But for now, we need some frame of reference. Labels, <laughs> yes, are challenging. Um, no one likes to be labeled and they are challenging, but if, if this were the Museum of Art, we would not be um, conveying the incredible quality and specialness of the genre that we are representing here. So for now, that's the label that in some ways we're sort of stuck with and, and we're, um, we're using that right now. Do you want to add anything else before we wrap up? Well, I, I think that, you know, there is an opportunity to grow, um, to, to grow this genre with our um, awareness in the 21st century of how we see other people, how we are not interested in marginalizing people, but being more inclusive, um, and how we are able to see connections between what these artists are making and um, ourselves, if we consider ourselves to be insiders, I guess. Um, so I think there, there are opportunities there to reimagine this genre, um, to update it, um, to still value what's going on in it, but um, to, um, you know, to be fair to the artists and to think about, you know, these are living, breathing people for the most part. Some of them have passed on, but um, that they had their own lives, they had their own individual um, ways of seeing the world and that you appreciate that and value that. Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. Very well said. Everyone, thank you for being with us. And thank you, Lisa Runquist, for your wonderful scholarship. I think uh, Becca might be saying a few words, but we're going to take a short break so that you can get a little stretch, maybe a beverage. And we'll be back shortly to talk about um, how we make curatorial decisions, talk a little bit more about outsider art. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's in the future for the Henry Darger Room. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Deb. This was really wonderful. Um, anybody who wants to tune in and hear the conversation, it will be live on our website um, in a few days. Um, and as Deb said, we'll take a 15 minute break. It's currently 1150 Eastern. Um, so we'll resume at 1205 Eastern, 1105 Central.
Um, we will all, the room will remain open. Um, however, we will all go on mute and the videos will go off. But if you'd like to stick around, we hope you do. Um, so look forward to the second part of our partnership discussion with Intuit. Thanks again.